So we're talking about becoming brand new. And uh, how, how would you like a do-over? I mean, just like, how would you like just for everything up until this point to, to be erased? Not just erased, removed. Or a wiping out as though it never had existed. That's becoming brand new, right? When you think about brand new, I, I think about a brand new car. A brand new car, that new car smell, right? If you can't afford it, don't go smell it. <laughs> you hear me? And I'm, I believe, God, there's a day you'll get a new, new one, but not at the expense of putting yourself under financial distress. And so, you know, it's funny if you've ever gotten a new car when you first get it. I mean, it's never been driven anywhere, right? Right. <laughs> And, and, you know, you, you, you park it in the parking lot, like far away, uh, just so there's no nicks or dings on, on the doors, right? Then eventually, you know, after it wears off just a little bit, you start, you know, you start parking it wherever you want to. You still try to space it, though, you know? <laughs> and then you think about the new season of football. Anybody glad football season's here? Man, I heard the ladies more than I heard the men. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, I... I played a lot of sports when I was coming up, and I always loved when we got our uniforms because they were new. Well, some of them were new, and then some of the helmets were new, but some weren't. But anyway, just work with me on that illustration. So anyway, but when, when you come into a new season, you have a brand new season, and you have no record. Becoming brand new. No record. New speakers that have never been heard before until we get them in our possessions. They're not, you know, they'll be clear and they're going to help. By the way, wait till you hear the experience that they bring. They help us bring. Be that much more engaging. Newborn baby, I, that's a, probably the most significant illustration that I can give because we, our second grandbaby, brand new, his name is Lewis, and many of you have been believing God with us because he was born three months early, but brand new. When he came into this earth, uh, Lewis had no past. Lewis had no shame. Lewis had no guilt. Why? Because he's brand new. Brand new. Jesus had some things to say about becoming brand new in John chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews in the Sanhedrin party that crucified Jesus. This man came to Jesus by night. He probably did it because, you know, if, he, if people found out his faith, he probably would lose his life or been ostracized. Or... But this man came to Jesus by night. And I want you to pay attention to this. Nicodemus said, Rabbi, talking to Jesus, he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Now, why did he know this? Because he said, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Nicodemus said, Jesus, you got my attention. I, I believe you're of God. There's just too many signs and wonders that, that prove that you are the Son of God. You are, you are sent from God. You are sent from above. Miracles convinced him. Signs and wonders convinced him. And, and Jesus' ministry, God's hand upon Jesus' ministry, validated that Jesus was God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And listen to what I'm getting ready to say, because I've never really seen it. I'm not saying you might have seen it before now, but I find it interesting that God, by the Holy Spirit, through these different signs and wonders and miracles, validated that Jesus was the Son of God. The hand of God upon Jesus got Nicodemus' attention. And because Nicodemus saw Jesus from God, Jesus shared with him the most critical message in the history of time and mankind. Most significant. God grabbed his attention through validation. Jesus grabbed his attention through, you got to be born again. Isn't it amazing? Talking about one thing, all of a sudden it seemed like Jesus changed the subject. No, he didn't. 
Jesus said, he respects me. I got I to gotta, I gotta tell him the truth. I got to get him ready. So, but Jesus said right after this, he answered Nicodemus and said, most assuredly, I say to you, Nicodemus, unless one is born again, unless someone's born from above, unless someone's born into the family of God, unless someone was born of the Spirit, unless someone becomes a new creation, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, try to figure it out with his mind. You know, when you try to figure out God with your mind, the word says, you know, especially when you don't know Jesus and you're not alive unto God, you're spiritually blind, and then the natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. That's why people are not born again, you might rub wrong, because there's life on you, life in you, and God's hand upon you, God's Spirit in you, God's, God, God's Holy Spirit upon your life in this world. So important to become born again. So we begin to understand the things of God and the kingdom of God. Then Jesus, he's, you know, Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Of course not. It's not a second physical birth. It's a rebirth spiritually. Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, have the natural birth, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Man, that's that's a serious indictment. The most significant, important message this earth has ever received. Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And that which is born of your flesh is your flesh. You had a natural birth. And, but that, what I'm talking about, when you receive me, that which is born of the Spirit will be your spirit. Your spirit is the part that gets born again. Your spirit is the part that becomes a new creation. Your spirit is the part that becomes a child of God. Your spirit is the part that receives the life and nature and character and fruit of the Spirit of God on the inside of us because we become born again. No record, undefeated. Brand new. To the point that Jesus said, well, the word says later on, you know how new you are? As far as the east is from the west, I have removed your transgressions from you. To become justified means just as if I'd never sinned because that sin was placed on Jesus. Yeah, we might mess up after we receive Jesus, but all you have to do is confess your sin and he's faithful and he's just to cleanse you and to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Man, becoming brand new, is it possible? You don't know what I did in the past. You don't know what I'm involved in right now. Things can change. Your life can be altered today. Your, your, your life can absolutely become brand new where you get an, uh, just a, you don't get renovated, you get regened with the gene of God. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit, but it's good anyhow. Don't marvel, Jesus said, that I said to you, you must be born, born, be born again. Listen, we had nothing to do with our natural birth, right? That which is born in the flesh is a flesh. We came through parents, a, a man and a woman, to procreate. We have nothing to do with our spiritual birth except... When we receive Jesus, we have to receive Jesus and what I'm getting ready to talk about so we can become born again. Verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Uh, One of the reasons why you can't see a change when somebody 
really gives our heart to God, receives Jesus, becomes a new creation. Again, you could stand two people side by side, but nothing changed in them physically. One could be born again, and one might not be, but you can't tell because it's an inside job. Now, I want to get you to a point today of understanding why did mankind need to be born again in the first place. Wouldn't you like to know that? Thank you. That's Elaine right there. <laughs> Let's go back to the book of beginnings in Genesis chapter 1 under verse 27. This begins the story of God's creation. So God created human beings in his own image. Who created, who created human beings? Who created human beings? So get rid of the theory of evolution. Because it's not God. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Here's, here's his, his plan. He created them male and female. Created he them. Then God blessed them. And then God said, hey, man, woman, be fruitful. Multiply. Procreate. Fill the earth. But also he said, man, I want to get... I'm, I'm delegating you authority to govern this earth and to reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. But we have to understand that God created us after his own image and likeness, and John 4, 24 gives us insight on who we are. God is a spirit, the word says, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What is God? How did he create us? In his own image. We are a spirit. We have a soul, a mind, will, emotions, personality, sensibilities, and we live in this body. It's our, the temple of our spirit on this earth. And, and the, one of the most miraculous things that ever happens when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're born again, and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your spirit. Then First Corinthians, or in the book of Corinthians, says, what? Don't you know that your body has become the temple of the Holy Spirit? Because you've been born again. The life and nature of God's come on you. Uh, the Holy Spirit's come on the inside of you to walk with you, to help you, to comfort you. Come alongside you. But you must be born again in order for that to happen. Job 32 8 says, But it's the spirit of man, the breath of Almighty, that makes him understand. So the Bible clearly tells us that, that mankind or humans are our spirits after the image of God. Now, this is what sets us apart from animals. This gives us the ability to fellowship with God, who is a spirit. He created us as a spirit, and I can fellowship with God. I, I don't want to put him down on this level, just like I can fellowship with you because you're not a, you're not a cow or a dog. You've been made in likeness of God. Now you can have direct fellowship with God. So this is not just getting saved, and, 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 and this, you know, this, what I'm talking about is not... not falling in love with religion or do's or don't. This is falling in love with God and a family. And, and, and now we can, we, can, we, can, we can fellowship with each other spirit to spirit. I love my dog, Bear. I'm still trying to usurp authority over her. She's four pounds, but she got, she got some stubborn in her. You know, you put a baby gate up there, and now she don't want to come upstairs. She waits on me. And I get her. She goes, here we go. Elevator. Will, we watch Will, our first grandson. And if I have Will in my hands, and I walk upstairs, Will's authority works. Because Bear comes on up. Why would I say that? I don't know. But anyway, I fellowship with God, and I want to know God more than I know anybody on this earth. He is God the Father. We can fellowship with Him through His Word and in prayer and amongst each other today. 
and taste and see that the Lord is good and, 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 and have that heart fulfilled that I can, call, I can talk to God as my Father because I've been born again. I've been born from above. I've been born into the family of God. First John 3 talks, oh, behold what love the Father has bestowed upon us that we would be called the children of God. And right now, if you receive Jesus, you become children of God. Not on the outside, on the inside. It's your spirit that gets born again. We're going to find out why. One of the reasons we have to say here is, is we have to understand when God created us spirits, he also gave us a free will. And he gave, us a, he, gave us, he gave us the responsibility to make good or bad decisions because he's given us free will. Because our spirit is in contact with God, but then he delegates authority to, to govern this earth. So we have the free will now to make good and bad decisions. Deuteronomy 30 says, today I'm giving you a choice, God said. There's two ways in front of you. I ask, I ask heaven and earth to be witnesses of your choices. You can choose life or you can choose death. The first choice will bring blessing. He said, look, I'm delegating that authority to you. Cho you know, if you choose life, you'll be blessed. Open book test here. The other choice will bring a curse. So he says, choose life. Then you and your children will live. You must love the Lord your God and obey him, never leave him, because he's your life. He's your what? He's your life. And he'll give you a long life in the land that he, the Lord, promised to give to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Listen, this is one of the reasons why. Why, why, why did a born-again experience happen? Well, God created man in his image. He was alive unto God. He was fellowshipping with God. He was given, he was given authority to govern this earth. He was, given, he was given the power of free will and choice. And now mankind was free to, free to choose but mankind was not free from the consequences of their choices. You're free to choose, but you're not free from the consequences of your choices. So now we go to the book of Genesis and take another step toward understanding. Why do I have to be born again? The book of Genesis, after mankind was given authority or dominion on the earth, he was given a command. He was given a warning. And after God did this, guess what? The free will of mankind was now being put to the test. Genesis 2.15, and the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden. Would he, he placed the man in there to tend the garden, watch over the garden. Now, why would you do that unless you had to tend something and watch over it from something or something trying to come in that garden we were going to have to guard against? So he gives mankind a commission, but then God gives mankind a warning. But the Lord God warned him. He said, you may eat freely from the fruit of every tree in the garden except... The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was a command. And now he gives mankind a warning. Before everything takes place, he's still alive unto God right now. Because God blew into that earth, dust to dust, ashes, ashes, earth, earth, body that was made out of clay. And he breathed in man. He became a living spirit, a living soul. He's alive unto God right now. Giving Adam and Eve instructions, a commission, a command, a warning. He said, if you can't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, come on, look at this real close. If you eat of this fruit, you're sure to die. You're sure to be separated from God. You're sure to die spiritually. Why? Why? Because we're going to see in a moment. Romans 3.23. You know what the word says? The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. And then the word says, for all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. We had wages to pay. We died. How did I die? 
Adam and Eve were tempted to disobey God and His Word. And you can see that in Genesis 3. Verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty, subtle, skilled in deceit than any living creature of the field which the Lord had made. Talk, who's the serpent we're talking about here? It's talking about a, a, a former archangel, praise and worship leader of heaven called Lucifer. That's his responsibility. He is so gifted. He walked with God. He, he walked with God and, and, and the praises of heaven he was responsible for until one day he said, I'm not satisfied with my assignment anymore. God, I want to be you. I want to take your place. I think I'm better. If I were them, I could lead better. Well, listen, when, when the creator hears a created being try to usurp his authority, that doesn't work. Adam, excuse me, Lucifer, who was an angel, because he used, tried to usurp authority over God, was turned into a devil. And Jesus said in the gospel, with the finger of God, I cast out devils. Don't be afraid of the devil. He's been, he's been defeated. Uh, but but he, you have to understand that Lucifer became, the serpent became the devil became all the different names he's named in the Word, and, and then he, he influenced a third of the angels to go with him. So now, no wonder why God said, hey, Adam, I'm giving you authority. You've got to use your authority because you're going to have to tend the ground. You're going to have to watch over the ground. You're going to have to protect that ground. You're going to have to protect your house. You're going to have to protect your family with my authority and with my presence. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. So the serpent was more crafty, subtle, skilled, deceit than any living creature of the field which the Lord had made. Never compare God with a devil. And the creator that I received recreated me, gave me back my authority so I can protect my house. And the serpent, Satan, who's a liar, he said to the woman, can, can it really be that God has said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? He's misinterpreting the word of God right there. And the woman said, straighten him out on this. He said, no, we may eat from the fruit of the tree of the garden, except the fruit from the tree, which is in the middle of the garden. God said, you shall not eat from it and don't even touch it, otherwise you're going to die. She remembered the warning of God. Choices. I place life and death before you. Blessings and cursings before you. Now choose life. The will of man was being tempted here. But the serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die. And, and whether she saw a serpent, talked to the serpent, I know one thing, he was communicating with her, and, and he, he comes in the form of a thought that is contrary to the word of God. And we got to win the battle of our mind every single day and make sure we check things like a gatekeeper. We keep the things of God inside and reject the liar who's trying to bring in a lie and to steal, kill, and destroy from our life. And right here, Adam should have enforced his dominion, taken authority over his thoughts, taken authority. He was supposed to protect his house. But the woman was the one Adam came. Listen, wait a minute. Men, stop relying on your wife to do your praying. Stop relying on your, I thank God, my wife prays, don't get me wrong. But every morning I'm saying, God, I, I bring before you my family. And I call out my natural family. And I bring before you my spiritual family. That what you've called me to. And I bring before you my regional responsibilities of all the ministers we oversee. Father, in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood of Jesus over my, my domain. 
And I say, I rebuke any foul spirit that would try to attach itself against me and my domain today, devil. Shut up. I bind hell and I lose heaven today. And then you're on guard. The devil's been lying to many of us here in this room. And let me tell you, a liar is not telling the truth. So he's, if he's messing with your mind concerning something contrary to the word of God, he's basically saying, that's not going to happen. Yes, sir. Did you get that? Because I'm walking in the truth. If he's going to be contrary to the truth and he's a liar, then he's lying about it. So here we go. Let me just bring this in so we can talk about this after our guest comes next week. And please come. And please invite people. You know, every, every, every pastor wants to have a good show and when guest ministers come in, say what they think you're important. No, I just want them to see what God's doing at Harvest Church. Uh, and all these viewing the line, please come if you can. But now we go to the place where man rebelled against God's Word. Man accepted lies. Mankind uh, dishonored God and now faces the consequence of dying spiritually. It's a spiritual death because you'll see that after Adam and Eve had missed it, died spiritually, they kept, living, they kept living physically. But a death took place. They died spiritually. In other words, they became separated from God. Spiritual death is when our spirit is separated from God because we had sinned and, and come short. And, and, and now we, our whole life has become dark and fallen and our, our spirit is dead. Nicodemus, you know I'm from God. You've got to be born again, Nicodemus. You've got to be born again. Romans 5.12 says, therefore a sin came into the world through one man, talking about Adam, and death as a result of sin, then death spread to all men, no one being able to stop it or escape its power because all men have sinned. When Adam sinned, he caused man born after him to be born and shapen in iniquity in their flesh. But let me tell you something that's not taught often and just check the word out on it. I believe that we're born and shaped in iniquity, but you can't tell me that, 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 uh, that Louis' spirit is dead. The spirit comes from God. The body's procreated flesh to a natural flesh birth, but the spirit comes from God. And that's why we ought to understand in Romans chapter 7, uh, Paul said, Paul said, I, I was alive unto God until the law came to my attention. And the law, I realized, I, 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 I disobeyed it, and then, then I died. My, spiritual di my spirit died. Now i got to be born again. This is where you talk about even with babies or kids or special people or retarded people, you can't tell me those kids are going to hell. Don't you ever let somebody think that a, a baby that has passed goes anywhere other than heaven. And if you've got, you know, I, I know that some of you in here have, have had some difficulties and maybe, maybe some, some births that didn't work out well. They're waiting for you in heaven. You can't tell me that my brother Billy, who was Down syndrome, special, you know, I believe in the gospel, but I believe there's a day and age of accountability, and you really couldn't put a name or a number on it, or an age on it. There comes a point in time that you understand something, and you go contrary to the Word of God, and then your spirit dies. Now we need to receive Jesus. Nicodemus, you must be born again, Nicodemus. 
You can't get into the heaven. You can't get into heaven. Listen, you, you're, you're, you're receiving a, a, a body that is born in sin, shaping an iniquity, Nicodemus. So now we got we to get life in you now, Nicodemus. No wonder why Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No one gets to the Father except through me because you can't be born again. You can, you have to be born again to get to heaven. That's why a lot of people saying they're Christians, but they're not changed, but they're not washed, but they're not, they, they, they act like they always have, and, and, and then they, they put Jesus on the label. When we get born again, Everything changes. Everything changes. Some Christians have the mistaken idea that eternal life begins when they die. No, that's not biblically accurate. Eternal life begins when we are born again into the kingdom of God. I'm alive unto God. In my spirit. Now, if the Lord tarries, my body will go to dust, but my spirit, who's alive unto God, will go straight into the presence of God. Listen, folks, when you get born again, you're not amended, you're not corrected. You're not improved. You're not an improved version of what you used to be. You are an absolutely brand new creation on the inside. You are completely detached from the person you once were before Christ. Have you been born again? Have you been born again? Jesus alone can offer eternal life. Because he that knew no sin was made to be sin for me. In the process of his going through the passion, if you'll remember when he was right in the middle of the passion, he turned to the Father and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He had to be forsaken so I could be forgiven. God had to turn his back on Jesus so he could reconcile me to the Father. Because he wasn't dying for himself. He was dying for me. He didn't go in the portals of hell for himself. He went to pay the penalty of my death sentence for me. And on the third day, God raised him from the dead. And Jesus now says, I'm the resurrection and I am the life. When you receive Jesus, your spirit receives life. 1 John 5, 11, God gave us eternal life, and the life is in the Son in 1 John 5, and it goes on to say, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. John 1, 4, in Him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. John 5, 40, come to me that you may have life, Jesus said. John 10, 28 says, I give them eternal life. They will never perish. John John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. In John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though their body may die, they'll live. Have you been born again? Have you been born again? What a story. Thank God. In Jesus' name, pray with me. Father, And we just bow our heads in prayer today, and we thank you for showing us through your word the true story. As much as I never want to seem like I'm correcting anybody, when you receive Jesus, you need more than just forgiveness. You need to become a whole new person, a whole new creation where you have no past. Where you become alive unto God. You're now reconciled to God. Now you can fellowship with Him heart, heart, heart to heart again. With every head bowed, every eye closed, right now, God's drawing you to Jesus if you don't know Him. And if you're not born again,
take heed to him drawing. Take heed to him drawing you to Jesus. If you're here today and say, Pastor Corn, if I were to die today, I don't know if I'm born again. Would you pray for me? Absolutely will. It'd be my honor. If that fits you today, raise up your hand right now. Say, Pastor Cohen, I need to be born again. I've done religion, but I need to be born again and receive new life. Please don't pay attention to anybody around you. Please don't pay attention to anybody that would, that would try to shame you and not, you know, so you don't raise your hand. We all have been this way. We all have raised our hand. We've all said, you know what? Wow, I've got to be born again. To your left, far left. I'm looking to my right. You're far left. Please, Pastor Coyne, include me in this prayer. Right? I want to make sure I'm good. The center section. The left section. You're far right. Thanks. I understand that some of you have to go to work, but if you don't, please... Please be in this moment because really this is the most critical and important time of the service. And I want us all to pray this prayer out loud together. And those of you who raise your hand, mean it with your heart. Those who want to raise your hand, just include yourself in this prayer. Everybody pray this. Say, God, I believe Jesus is your son. I believe you sent him to this earth. God with us to live an innocent life so that we can receive new life and so you could die for my sin my death penalty my separation from God and on the third day once you took on my guilt then God came and raised you from the dead Jesus, you are the resurrection and life. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me for all my past. Now I'm coming to you. I need you. And I receive you, Jesus, as my personal Lord and Savior. By faith, I take you with my heart. And by faith, I say out of my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Thank you, God. I'm now a child of God. I've been born again. I have new life on the inside.